So most universities will ask you to submit application by December 15, January 1st, January 3rd. Um, so yeah, I mean, you will be given enough time to build a very solid application and you need to organize yourself in order to meet all the deadlines and not miss a single day. So that is very important. Okay, any further questions? Okay, so um, we know that you should be, um, you should take the TOEFL or the IELTS, whatever um, test recognized by the universities that you end up, ended up taking, you should have good grades. Yeah, your academic profile should be very competitive. Um, yes, you should submit a resume, but how long does it take you to build a solid resume? Something that is, I would call it, um, grad school material sort of resume. Okay, here is one thing. Um, the culture and the mindset of American students is very different from ours because culturally speaking in Tunisia, it is very normal to jump immediately from one level of study to another. You haven't even completed your license yet and you're already looking for a master's. Um, it's not a critic, it's just the way our system is built. So that is completely normal for Tunisia, okay? For Americans, it's not necessarily the case. I would say over 70% of students in the US, even more than that, I just don't have any accurate numbers, but I know it's um, the larger number of students. They take time off if not during their undergraduate education, they take time off after to work for one, two to three years. And by joining, by the, the mix of their professional experience and their undergraduate degree, they know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. And this is how they pick their graduate degree. Okay, so universities would expect you to have at least one to two years of work experience. But it's not two one solid year or two solid years. Um, you can get um, a summer internship from here, a summer internship in internship from there, a six month internship from there. And when you um, do the math, sometimes you can have around one to two years. We're not asking you to be um, top middle management candidates. That's not what's required. Well, unless you're applying for an EMBA, but um, you do we do require you to have some sort of knowledge, to be knowledgeable of what's happening in the field of the um, field of study that you want to end up studying, okay? Just know what's out there because the more you get work experience or you get exposed to the professional wor world of the f your field of study, the more um, you build arguments of what you want to change in it, how you want to improve it, and why you picked it. Okay, does it make sense? And all of those details should be mentioned in your essays, either for the Fulbright or for the uh, application. So the application process is very similar to what the um, Fulbright application is required, uh, requiring. So now we talked about the grades, the language testing, um, the resume, and um, the work experience, well, slash resume, okay? and the essays. So some universities would ask you about personal essays and some universities will just give you a blank piece of paper and ask you to write something, whatever you want to tell us. Um, the third scenario is, okay, so explain what you're doing and why you wanted to do it. So these are the three different kinds of essays that you might end up working, uh, writing for a university. Um, Sometimes universities or programs like the Fulbright would ask you for two types. So your statement of purpose, so something more personal that tells a lot about your personality, who you are as a person, your future plans, uh, how you made your life choices and, and how good of a leader you are, how good of a representative of your country you are. Um, and the second one, the research objectives, which is tech about technical details and technical aspects of um, the masters you're going to choose and what you're going to do with it and how are you going to help your Tunisia and your home community with um, once you come back yeah with uh, once you come back and once you complete your program okay does it make sense
Do you want to add anything today? No, basically that's it. For the Fulbright application, as Miriam said, we're going to be asking for like two essays. Um, we ask applicants to take time to write your essays, especially for your personal statement. Um, if Sometimes I know it's hard for people to talk about themselves. I tell them just to go and ask friends and family to describe you and let you know, uh, you know what to write in your personal statement. And mm -hmm. what we're looking for is how did you get interested in the field and why you want to pursue it and why you want to make a career out of it. And the study slash research objectives, if you're doing research, why you want to, you know, how did you get interested in that research? What do you want to do? Get as technical as possible. Don't worry, we do have people from, you know, uh, institutions, different institutions from universities and Ministry of Higher Education, so they know exactly, you know, the technical terms of whatever thing you're doing. So and that uh, study research objectives, we want it to be as technical as possible. We want to know through it as a reflection of how good you are in mm -hmm. your field and how good your knowledge of your field is. Yeah, exactly. Um, one more component that you also um, might want to work on as soon as possible is your recommendations. You, for most cases, uh, for most universities, I think including the Fulbright program, you'll be required to submit two to three recommendations. I believe it's three. Uh, for the Fulbright. And these are a mix uh, of your uh, academic recommendations, academic references, and professional ones, okay? Um, regardless of who you'll end up choosing, the person who is eligible to recommend you both academically or professionally should be your direct supervisor. Meaning it, it is someone who taught you in class or your direct supervising supervisor at work, if you worked. Okay, so these are the two kinds of uh, people who are eligible to recommend you. Okay, and what is in a recommendation? What do you write in a recommendation? Yeah, basically. But you can start by writing something. It depends. Well, to get that detail about you writing anything clear, um, some professors or teachers or um, supervisors don't are not very familiar about um, with writing recommendations, especially the professional ones, because um, an academic recommendation is very different from a professional reference, because a reference is just contact information that you give your recruiter. And they're either going to ask them specific questions through emails, or they're going to pick up the phone and call them. So most of the time, it's a phone call. It's a phone call, okay? But an academic um, recommendation needs work on your side and on the recommender's side. And you're the one who should start the work with two things. The first thing, how to approach your recommender is crucial. The second thing, how you're going to assist your professor or recruiter, um, well, your, your supervisor, uh, how are you going to assist them with the recommendation process? How to approach. First piece of advice, give them time. Don't come a week in advance asking them for a recommendation immediately because the recommendation process, it needs time to be understood but it doesn't need require so much time to be actually done, okay? So take a couple of months. Look, I'm going to need a recommendation for that specific program and please give details about the programs uh, as, as much as possible. As, um, do, you, do you agree with me? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, this is how you're going to approach. Uh, Madame Fulena, Monsieur Fulen, I'm currently in the process of applying to this program. I have two months before I have to submit an application. And they're very specific about their ways of submitting an application. So have a tablet or a laptop. Do you, can I take a, five minutes of your time? Show them how it's done. And afterwards, tell them, look, don't worry about it. I will tell you what you should highlight in my profile. This is how American universities expect the recommendation to be, okay? so. They shouldn't really focus about how good academically the candidate is because if if people who are going to review your application want to know uh, want to know 
more about how academically excellent you are they'll just go and they're just going to look at your grade transcripts but what is it that the grades what the grades can tell what else do you want to say to the selection committee um, on the university's behalf or on your employer's behalf these are the things that should be highlighted for example um, you should talk about um, for example if you have a grade that got a little bit lower, a lower, sorry, and you want to, you want to prove that that grade does not represent your strength. You could ask the professor who gave you that grade to recommend you, and he or she can highlight you as a student and your efforts to learn in class and your efforts to understand and to like that field of study and this is how you, you you create some sort of a balance between grades that you want to camouflage somehow and um your real academic value so that can be a very solid strategy or how good of a um a student you were in class you pay attention in class you're always on time um they know your name which is already a good thing um, how, how yes, uh, how you collaborate with other students, how do you work in a team, how do you accept challenges, how do you deal with challenges, how do you deal with pressure, how do you de deal with uh, challenging assignments. So all of those things um, should, be, um, should be reflected and highlighted in a recommendation. So sometimes, I mean, professors they have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students so they sometimes know you and remember that they liked you in class but they forget so just you can write bullet just bullet points just to remind them of the things you want to highlight in your profile okay that is one thing the second thing the second piece of advice about um how to assist um your professor or your employer on how to write recommendations do not write something and ask them to sign it. That is not ethical and that can get you into trouble because you will already be submitting two to three essays. If you write your recommendations, they will figure out that you were the one who wrote them down. Okay? So if you have a professor who does not sound very receptive to or enthusiastic about providing you with a recommendation, just thank them for their time and go ahead and see someone else. Okay? What about the language of um, the recommendation? Yeah, so the language of recommendation, basically you're applying to American universities, so all your credentials um, and your documents should be in English. You have two things. You should either provide something that is originally re written in English, or sometimes, well, this is basically done with high school students, but you could, should give it a try. You should have your recommender collaborate with an English professor um, and they can translate or work together only on the language though because we know sometimes um, translations take time and some of you don't have the budget to spend more than a specific amount of money amount of money on one application so you might want to take that into consideration all you need to do is to keep it ethical and transparency is the key because they will find out okay so that is very important what well, we try to look in an, uh, you know, when we look at your applications and we read your, your recommendation letters, we try to uh, get a sense of how prepared you are for um, academic life in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in grad school. And that's exactly what American schools will be looking for. When people just sit down and review hundreds and hundreds of applications and reading, you know, so many recommendation letters, that's exactly what they're looking for. What professors are, are telling them about how prepared you are for grad studies in the U.S. And just um, one comment that could be very helpful. So we have a specific committee to review the Fulbright applications, but who do you think is going to review your applications once they get to the university? There is a difference between the undergraduate admission process and the graduate admissions process. So the undergraduate admissions process, they have an office which is um, the International Admissions Office or the Admissions Office in general. And these are staff members who are qualified to review high school student applications for undergraduate programs. But if you are looking for a graduate opportunity, it is the faculty and staff who will take care 
um, of pretty much more than 80% of the selection process. And this is why I ask you to be as detailed as possible when you talk about your field of study and, um, and your choice of diploma, because you are very likely to be selected with someone that will teach you in class at some point if you are accepted. Okay, so the process is very different. So bear in mind what is happening on the other side before you work on what needs to be done on your side. Put yourself in their shoes. You are asking for a huge amount of money, um, who, which is very selective, and admission in a very selective university. If you were on the other side of the table, how would you act? Think about this, then work on your application. Okay? Does it make sense? In a way, try to look at the bigger picture, um, how competitive you should be, because you have to also look at your competition. You're not just competing with the group of people applying for, like Tunisians applying for that particular master's degree, but you're mm -hmm. competing with Americans applying to that particular master's degree and the rest of the world also, who's <laughs> well, they're applying you know, to that particular program. Just try to look at the bigger picture and try to, um, as much as possible, to make your application as competitive as possible. Yeah, exactly. So um, just bear in mind that the selection process for the Fulbright program is, is inspired from what is the universities are um, what the things are that are required by the university itself so um, you won't I mean once you're nominated for the Fulbright you it won't take much until you complete the rest of your application whatever that needs to be submitted to the university what is the difference basically um, standardized testing have you heard of it before so once you're nominated for the Fulbright yay Awesome. What happens next? You are about to choose a university. How are you going to do that? On what basis? The, na the name of your new university? Thank you so much for saying this. Um, just one comment related to his comment and I'll get back to you. So, the name of the university According to my very basic experience in academic advising, for graduate students has absolutely no value whatsoever. It is the department that counts, the department that offers the field of study in which you're interested. So do not think of University X, University Y, and University Z. Think of University X, Department of Engineering, Department of um, um, of business, department of whatever it is that you're looking for. So think department, don't think, don't look at the bigger picture, be more specific. Okay, so that is very important. Um, you had a question there? No, I mean, I'm about to answer. Yeah. What you, I mean, it depends on several factors to choose the university. Yes. You know, um, I mean, what you want to study. What yeah, that's you correct. Specific field that maybe it exists maybe for instance in New York and does it exist in another state for instance? So you well, um, this, uh, if you're looking for something very specific and you already are a Fulbright nominee, just you should congratulate yourself because you have been specific enough about how and why you want that field of study. The rest of it, yes, sometimes it can be challenging to find some field of studies. Um, but you will be given enough time to look for the final list and you will have to come up with four universities. Okay, um, that is not a problem. So, in terms of the accessibility to specific field of study, I don't think. Well, it's not a matter of where, what state you will be end up studying in. It's it's just a case by case department or a case by case university. Some universities offer um, have a very developed, let's say, engineering um, department. Some others have do have an engineering department, but they don't offer as many degrees as, or as many graduate degrees as some other universities um, do. Okay, 